In the name of Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, let's not forget the context of Jacob's marvelous dream. He's dreaming this dream not from the comfort of his own bed. He's dreaming it out in nature, under the stars. And and he doesn't have a pillow under his head. His pillow that night is a rock. And it's not because he's camping. It's because he's running away from home. He's running from his brother Esau, who wants him dead. Oh yes, Jacob got his blessing. He convinced a hungry Esau on one fateful day to sell him his blessing for a bowl of soup. And then he tricked his father, his nearly blind father Isaac, by dressing up like Esau. He had his mother Rebekah cook an Esau-like meal. Now, maybe you would say, but after all, the Lord himself had told Rebekah years ago, the older will serve the younger. And so there you have it. God has already said Jacob is the one who will inherit the blessing. But just as little as Abraham's adultery with Hagar was a God-pleasing way in which to get the son the Lord had promised him, so little are Jacob's lies and trickery and deception a God-pleasing way for him to get the blessing. So now he has to leave. And even that's under false pretenses. His mother, Rebecca, concocts a story about how she really wants Jacob to be married to to a member of their family from the old country instead of getting a pagan wife from the local area like Esau's God. She's clever. This is exactly what Abraham did for Isaac. So she appeals to Isaac's own past, and Isaac consents. He says, fine, go. And he sends Jacob off with his blessing to Haran and to Uncle Laban. Look at sin, and look at sin's consequences. Jacob's trickery pays off, but the law of unintended consequences means that now he's brought division to his family. Now he has to run off into exile. Jacob now is no longer the scion of a wealthy father. He's become the servant of an equally tricksy boss. And even 20 years later, Jacob isn't sure that his brother Esau doesn't still want him dead. Look at your life. Look at your sins. What are the unintended consequences? Where's the chaos? Where's the division? Where's the discord? Where's the disorder? Where's the anger because of you? It's almost a rule of nature that... Once you get something, after doing whatever it takes to get it, whatever it is you want, whatever it is you need, once you've decided you're willing to do what it takes, even if it means going against God's will, it's never quite as sweet once you have it because of what you did, because of how you got it, because of your sin. And ultimately sin, all sin, leads to Jacob-like exile. Adam and Eve sin. They disobey God's direct command, his very clear command. They're cast into exile outside of Eden. Cain sins. He destroys life. And God marks him and casts him out into exile as a wanderer for the rest of his life. God's chosen people, both in the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, sin for centuries, worshiping false gods, making political alliances with anybody and everybody but God. And God casts them out into exile, using Babylonians and Persians and Assyrians, eventually Romans even, to punish them. Removing them from their home, removing them from their temple. Eventually, of course, you have hell. The wicked do not inherit the kingdom of God. They simply stand outside God's kingdom. They look at that locked door and they hear the voice of Jesus say, I don't know you. So now we find Jacob on the road. The sun goes down. Jacob's looking for a place to stay, a place to stop for the night. He finds a likely spot to bed down, and he looks for the comfiest rock he can find for a pillow because he has nothing else. 
20 years later, on his way home, coming home richer than he could ever have imagined, more blessed by God than he ever would have imagined, Jacob said, I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan. In sin, we wander with less than we usually imagined we would have because the world has a great way of taking from us. And because the devil has a great way of giving and then taking away himself without telling us about it. The devil is quick to offer fruit, sweet fruit, but he forgets to tell you the price. He'll give you the world and fail to mention that you forfeit your soul. And usually most of the world they write along with it. And so Jacob dreams. And this is where the story takes an unexpected twist because from every movie we've seen, from every book we've read, from every Shakespearean drama, we expect Jacob to have a terrible night, a night of guilt-ridden dreams, a night of dreams where he sees his brother Esau coming after him, filled with vengeance to destroy him. But instead, God himself invades Jacob's dream. And the Lord shows Jacob Jesus. The Lord shows Jacob forgiveness. The Lord shows Jacob grace. The Lord gives Jacob back his faith. We can't climb up to heaven. We, we just can't get there. We can't bridge the chasm that exists between us and God. It can't be done. The rich man learned about that. The rich man Jesus talks about in Luke chapter 16, all he wanted was a drop of water, and Father Abraham said, there's nothing I can do. This hole, this division is fixed. Even here on earth already, we're stuck. We have no choice, no chance, no hope on our own. Cast out of the garden, into exile, we're marked. Marked by the sinful image and likeness of our own parents. Our tricks... They're for naught. We can't hide. We can't run. We can't blame anyone else. Except God comes. God comes and he invades our sleep. He invades our world with his son, with his chosen one, with Jesus. With Jesus, who's sitting among his new disciples, says to them on one occasion, You shall see heaven open." and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus announced himself to be the connection between earth and heaven. Jesus announced himself to be what Jacob saw, the only way to the Father. And there at the top, what does Jacob see? He sees the one whom he defended by his sin. He sees the one from whom he begs and pleads for forgiveness. He sees the Lord. And the Lord speaks. I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. He identifies himself to Jacob. And he uses that name above all other names. He calls himself the Lord. Yahweh, I am. He doesn't come to Jacob tonight as the terror bringer and the cursor and the destroyer and the master. He comes as the promise maker. He comes as the promise keeper. He comes as the God who spoke to Jacob's grandfather Abraham. He comes as the God who spoke to Jacob's father Isaac. He comes as that God, that Lord, and he speaks to Jacob. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Despite your sneakiness, the Lord says, despite your sin, I will keep my promise. These words give us evidence. Evidence of Jacob's repentance. Otherwise, the Lord would have treated Jacob like Cain, right? He would have come down and said to him something like he said to Cain, who was still hiding his murder. Sin is crouching at your door. It wants to have you. Instead, he says to Jacob, you'll be back. You'll come home. I will hold this land in trust and reserve for you. Esau will not take it. Your enemies will not move in. It will be yours. I will bring you back. Your descendants, the Lord said, will be like the dust of the earth. 
and will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. Oh, what wonder must have filled Jacob that night. Especially, especially as he heard the Lord speak to him using the second person singular pronoun, you. I will give you this land. You will be a great nation. Your descendants will spread out to the compass points. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. And there it was. There it was, the big one, the messianic promise. The promise that everyone will be blessed through Jacob, through a seed coming from Jacob, through the Christ, that is the one who will save his people from their sins. And even more wondrous, the Lord didn't stop there. He said to Jacob again, I am with you, and I will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. The Lord makes explicit for Jacob what had up until that point really been implicit. You will survive. I will bring you back. Every word that the Lord speaks to Jacob in this dream drips with forgiveness. It drips with grace. The Lord appears to bless, not chastise. The Lord appears to show Jacob the stairway that he uses to connect heaven and earth. The Lord appears to announce that even though Jacob had proven faithless, he would remain faithful. And the Lord doesn't spend that evening shaming Jacob with his past or future faults. He just opens Jacob's heart. He opens Jacob's mind to hear his words. Here is what I will give you. Here is what you will receive. Here is what I have brought for you. In this dream, the Lord says ever so clearly, I will do the giving. You will not do the taking. And thus stands our relationship with God. Miserable sinners we are. When we grasp and grab and spend our lives trying to get, we end up just being tricksters, Jacobs. And that causes us to live in fear of everything surrounding us. A hostile world, an attacking devil, a bitter flesh. And they all want a piece of us, and they gladly take it. And in our sin, we think that God is the same way. And we've earned that. We've deserved it. But then we hear the Apostle Paul this morning speaking theologically about what Jacob saw in his dream. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So that now, he says, we have peace with God. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. We grasp and scheme and plot and destroy, but God gives. God gives, not what we earned, not what we deserved, but he gives out of his love. He used his own flesh, the flesh of his son Jesus, to build a stairway that gives us access to heaven, that gives us access to the Father. He did the giving of what we could never take, himself. He gives himself into death. He gives us faith in that death, the faith that saves us the faith that marches us up each and every step of that stairway, that stairway that is Christ right up into heaven. The context of Jacob's marvelous dream is exactly the same context in which we live as we hear this marvelous pronouncement of God. Poor, miserable sinners. We bring nothing but pain and agony into our lives. We bring only rock-hard pillows into our lives. And so God makes a promise. God says, I will fix what's broken. God plants the seeds of salvation as he builds a bridge to somewhere, to heaven, through Jesus, who got it built. The Son of Man must suffer many things 
and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, he must be killed and after three days rise again. Christ said that. But more importantly, he did that. Christ made Jacob's dream real. And by faith, Jacob grasped that. By faith, we grasp that. And by faith, we cry out with Jacob, Surely the Lord is in this place. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And the gate of heaven is where Jesus is. And where Jesus is, we find the escape from our sinfulness. We find escape from our death. And Jesus tells us where he is. He locates himself in a revealing word. He locates himself in a forgiving meal. He locates himself in a sin-washing baptism. Not dreams, but reality in Christ. Amen.